from Washington, D.C., this is Middle East Focus. Hello, and welcome to Middle East Focus, a weekly podcast on regional affairs and U.S. policy produced by the Middle East Institute in Washington, D.C. I'm Alistair Taylor, and the Eyes Editorial Director. On today's program, we'll be discussing the Iranian hostage crisis, how it shaped U.S.-Iran relations, and what that history tells us about the present and potential future of the Islamic Republic. The hostage crisis began 42 years ago, on November 4, 1979, when a group of Iranian student radicals stormed the U.S. Embassy in Tehran and took 52 U.S. diplomats and citizens hostage. They were held for 444 days before ultimately being released on January 20th, 1981. The crisis played a key role in shaping the trajectory of the Iranian Revolution and redefined relations between Washington and Tehran, helping to set them on the path they've been on ever since. There's a lot to discuss on today's program, but thankfully we've got two great guests to help us make sense of things. Alex Vitanka and Michael Matrinka. Alex is the director of MEI's Iran program, a senior fellow with the Frontier Europe Initiative, and the author of The Battle of the Ayatollahs in Iran, the United States, Foreign Policy, and Political Rivalry Since 1979. Michael is a retired member of the U.S. Foreign Service, who was a political officer at the embassy in Tehran in 1979, was one of the 52 hostages. Alex, Michael, thank you both for joining us today, and welcome to the program. Thank you, Alistair. Glad to be here. Michael, let's start with with you. Can you kind of set the scene for our listeners a little bit? What was the mood like in in Tehran in the fall of of 1979? What did it what did it feel like to be working at the U.S. embassy at that time? By 1979, we were deep in the throes of unrest, sort of dissatisfaction, lots of emotion on every side. It, of course, went back several years. There had been a gradual buildup all through 1978. I spent most of 1978 in the city of Tabriz, where I was the consul. We had had a succession of, not riots, but, well, riots, rallies, riots, uh, present sort of mob violence, and a fair amount of shooting, people getting wounded, people getting killed, imprisonments. It started with the death of Ayatollah Khomeini's son, Mustafa, and just continued on and on, resulting, of course, in the departure of the Shah, from Iran in 1979, a new government taking over, and then more of the same, more of the same violence, more of the same mob and uh, protest meetings or demonstrations. It was not an easy time, but people got used to it. The way you get used to increasing pain if it comes in short increments you don't notice the fact that it's a little bit harder than the day before or the day before that. By the summer of 1979, there had been periods of relative calm, periods of lots of trouble, lots of executions were continuing, of course, with the members of the old regime and people who were opponents of the revolution. By October of 1979, there were some serious problems going on. We had reopened the consular section of the embassy, and it had been closed for several months from the end of 1978 until the springtime of 1979. It was reopened at the request of the Iranian government, the new revolutionary government, and what we saw was an incredible surge of people who were trying to get visas to leave Iran. Now, the passport office for the government of Iran had also been closed all across the country. And Ayatollah Khomeini finally made a comment, something like, anyone who wants to leave can go. So restrictions were lifted, and a date was announced for the opening of the Iranian National Passport Office. So many people rushed to the passport office to get new passports so they could depart the country that the building literally started to collapse. It had to be closed down. It was condemned. The building started to sag from the sheer volume of people, and it was reopened up at the International Fairgrounds on a level one floor building that had a solid structure below the uh, floor. That meant that not only thousands, but perhaps hundreds of thousands of people suddenly started applying at the Western embassies and other embassies for visas. Our visa office, our visa section in the consular unit, had so many people applying that the line went almost a block long on any given day. 
And by October of 1979, the line was so long that if you wanted to apply for an American visa, the earliest appointment you could get was many months in the next year. So when the revolutionary government or when people who were following this, watching this, watching us, looked at our embassy, they would see crowds of hundreds and hundreds of people standing in line trying to get visas. And it wasn't just, you know, members of the Pahlavi regime. It was everybody. You could see mullahs standing in line and soldiers standing in line and teachers and young people, old people, rich people, poor people, all sorts of people. All of us at the embassy, certainly I, because I had been there for so many years at this point, were barraged with, you know, pleas to help me get a visa. This was an indication that there was some serious trouble starting for the regime. It was sort of an echo of what was going on behind the closed doors of where the regime people met. I had a great many people trying to get visas through me, from me, etc., even though I was in the political section. And I will just say one thing, that the last two visas that I agreed to get were visa requests by two of the Ayatollah Osma. At that point, there were five or six you know, major Ayatollahs in the country, and two of them wanted to leave with their entire families to go to the United States, two out of the five top ones. That was an indication of the sort of trouble that was happening. In October of 1979, Ayatollah Talagani, the Friday prayer leader, died. Rumors went all around the country that he had been assassinated. I won't go into that. That's a whole topic of a whole different uh, presentation. But you had things like that happening. And of course, we had the serious threat of the Shah being admitted to the United States. The embassy staff, our charge, others on the staff, had been promised over and over by the Pentagon, by the State Department, that the Shah would not be given admissions to the United States. We were caught by surprise when it happened. And that basically sent the relationship between the embassy and the government in Iran into a spiral downwards. So we were faced with all that. Now, having said that, we were also accustomed to constant demonstrations around the embassy, around other main buildings. People were demonstrating about everything, some in protest, some in support, but everybody was demonstrating all the time. So we were used to the noise, to the sort of low level of violence, to people being arrested, etc. And the morning of the actual takeover seemed to be just more of the same. Another demonstration passing by the embassy which, as it turned out, was for us a terminal demonstration. Alex, turning to you, what was the, the sort of immediate spark of the, the storming of the embassy, and how did that fit into the larger power struggle that was underway in Tehran as different factions competed for the control in the, in the aftermath of the revolution? Thank you, Alistair. Let me start off by saying what a pleasure it is to be on this podcast with my very good friend, Michael Matrenko, who I've learned so much from over the years. And, you know, I was uh, I was a four or five year old when all this unfolded. Although I lived in Tehran at the time, I was too young to know what was going on. And Michael has over the years told me because he was there, he saw it, and I have always benefited from his insights. In terms of your question, Alistair, look, I mean, it's, as you know, we all know this is a uh, one of the most chaotic moments in my Modern Iranian history, the period from when Ayatollah Khomeini arrives from Paris in February 1st, 1979, to the taking over the embassy on the 4th of November the same year, this is a very chaotic period. You have all sorts of groups looking to jockey for power, maximum power. Many of these same groups had been just a few weeks earlier in the same camp against the Shah, but as soon as the Shah has left the country, they turn their attention on each other. You know, I know there are many different ways of looking at what exactly led to the taking over of the embassy. In fact, we don't know for sure. We don't know for certain that Ayatollah Khomeini knew beforehand what these radical students were about to do when they overran the embassy. But what we do know is Khomeini and his closest advisors, including the Supreme Leader of Iran today, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, they very quickly realized this is a politically expedient thing to do. And let me just summarize in my mind what that was. 
by siding with the radical students, many of whom would have come from the sort of radical leftist ideology that was more pro-Soviet, anti-American in its DNA, by sort of siding with their students, what Khomeini and his group ended up doing was to take away anti-Americanism from the left and embrace it, adopt it as something that belonged to them as a way of making sure they could exploit anti-Americanism, which unfortunately at the time had a lot of followers. We have to remember this is the Cold War period. There are a lot of people who are anti-American from various schools of thought. And Khomeini thought, I will take this mantle I will own it. And then he did that for the next 444 days till Michael and his colleagues were released. In the process, and we'll get to that later on, as we all know, the country's interests were damaged so severely on so many fronts. But at the time, politically for what Khomeini wanted to do, which was to consolidate power, doing what he did seemed to have made a lot of sense to him and his close advisors. Michael, picking up where you left off earlier, what was it like in the embassy on on November 4th, on that day? Can you can you describe the, the scene for us? On November 4th, I had gotten to the embassy unusually early. I normally rarely went into the embassy in the early morning because I was out every night with Iranian friends. I was in the embassy. I had gotten there at around 8.30 or 9 o'clock in the morning. My house or my apartment was only about two or three blocks away from the embassy, and I would walk over. I had a meeting scheduled for the late morning. I had another meeting scheduled for earlier in the morning, someone coming in to pick up passports. I had uh, a meeting with serious revolutionaries for later in the morning. As a matter of fact, it was the two sons of Ayatollah Talagani who had just died a couple of weeks before that. They were coming to see me about a trip they planned on taking, or they said that was the reason for the trip. You know, I had lunch plans to go off with my former housemate, I had served three years in the Peace Corps in Iran, and I had an Iranian housemate at the time for about half a year. He had come into the city. He was visiting from um, another city, and he wanted to go to lunch. I was going to see him. I had evening plans. There was nothing in the day prior to that day that told me, better not make any plans. We knew the Shah was in the United States. Fine. But there had been not much of a reaction at first. Now, the charge, Bruce Langan, the head of security and the acting deputy chief of mission, had all left the embassy to go down to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to have a meeting. The others of us were in the embassy conducting business as normal, except that noise started. Not unusual. My office faced the main street. I was used to noise and noisy demonstrations passing by all the time. But then the noise became very, very loud, as in it's not distant noise from hundreds and hundreds of feet away. It's noise from right here under the building. And that's what it was. The crowds were already coming across the walls and uh, sort of milling around in the grounds of the embassy itself. And what was going on then was people trying to get in touch with our charge. Remember, this was 1979. We didn't have the ease of communication that we have today. Uh, Today, I've been on the phone with several different countries. I press a button on my phone, then WhatsApp or Signal or some other fine communication system immediately puts me in contact with anyone I want all around the world. This was not the case in 1979. Communications were far, far more difficult. So it was not so easy. We did get in touch with Bruce Langan. And the instructions were, don't shoot, hold the fort, you know, just don't shoot, don't do anything to provoke the crowd, which was fine. The Marines understood that. By the way, the Marines we had there were superbly disciplined. The Marines I knew, who were always sort of, you know, friendly guys who joked a lot, had become almost machines from a science fiction movie. They changed dramatically. They went into full discipline mode, and it was sort of awesome to watch. Well things started changing pretty quickly. I was already on the uh, second floor. My office was across the hallway from the ambassador's office. And we started to group up there. We had gas masks because tear gas had been set loose on the bottom floor of the embassy. And from then on, it was just a matter of waiting while the crowds ran through the embassy and started trying to come into the doors where we were. There was one group of us who had gone down to the communications unit They were trying to destroy documents and whatever else they thought was worth destroying. And another group of us 
were in the ambassador's suite. And that's what was happening. And, you know, it was sort of chaotic. There was no one really in charge inside the embassy at that point, because three of the people who would have been one, two, three for giving orders, the charge, his acting deputy, and, you know, the head of security were gone. And they were just passing orders or trying to from far away in a different location and over a telephone line. When did you have a sense of where things were headed? When I picked up the phone in the ambassador's office or one of the phones and I called the people who had convinced me that they had to see me, you know, early that morning at the embassy, the two Iranians who were very revolutionary, et cetera, et cetera. And I dialed the phone of one of them and his own security guard answered. I knew his security guard very well. I thought, you know, they were all friends of mine. And I just said, do you know what's happening here at the embassy? And he answered, um, yes, Michael, we know. I said, can I talk to Mehdi? And he said, Michael, he won't talk to you. And then he said, Michael, I myself am really sorry. Click, <laughs> click. So I'd been set up. I knew that at that point. Oh, that was fine. Politics have no mother or father, as the Iranians say. And uh, it didn't that day. And that's when we realized this was going to be a different, really a different day. Now, did I have any concept in advance that the day might turn out like this? That day, no. We were accustomed to the sort of constant beat of demonstrations and mobs and noise on the street and all of the ranting and raving against the United States from various crowds and groups and factions. At the same time, we had good relations with most of the people in the cabinet, most of the ministers, several, of, a couple of them were American citizens. We had good relations with a lot of the clergy. We had good relations with a lot of the revolutionary power brokers. A very close friend of mine had become a minister. You know, I won't give the name, but he was a very close friend. I'd known him for years, and uh, we met frequently while he was a minister. It went on like this. And also, the only precedents for this were when the embassy had been taken on you know, February 14, earlier that same year, and then the local security forces had rushed in and, you know, the people who took the embassy had been disbanded. And my own case in Tabriz, when the consulate in Tabriz was also overrun, and I went to prison for just a day or two. But it had all been over, you know, in a short period of time. So there was an assumption that that's, that was going to be the same on this occasion. In fact, when we were blindfolded and led out and eventually taken in my case, to the ambassador's residence with a large group of other Americans, the hostage takers said, this won't last long. It's going to be over pretty soon. You know, we're just waiting, you know, for something. And uh, that was that. We assumed and they assumed that it was just a, uh, a sort of symbolic measure. So things changed. Something happened back there where, uh, you know, Khomeini and his Close supporters were meeting, and they decided to prolong it. Alex, curious to get your thoughts on this, you know, based on the research that you've done for your, your book. Do you have a sense of what changed that dynamic, of how that, that kind of calculus changed from the initial takeover to transform the agenda? You know, I think basically what really happens is Khomeini and his closest advisors, people like uh, Mohammad Beheshti, uh, Akbar Hashemi Rafsanjani, perhaps even Khamenei, although Khamenei wasn't at the top end of the list at the time, he later became president and then subsequently supreme leader. But they make the judgment call that basically this is politically expedient. This is a way for us to consolidate. Remember, I mean, what are, who are the first people to abandon the revolution? It's the provincial government of Mehdi Barzagan and the liberal Islamists that had been the face of this new revolution for pretty much the period since March 1979 till when they resigned, I believe, on the 5th of November, the day after. Basically, they said, look, we had a revolution 
to get rid of the Shah of Iran and we want a, a democracy, we never bargained to have a fight with the United States and turn Iran into a pariah state, which is exactly what Iran became. I mean, Khomeini and his people, whether they knew what they were doing, I, I doubt. I don't think Khomeini at the time, because later on, he bemoaned the fact that Iran had so few friends around the world. On one famous occasion, he turns around and he says to Rafsanjani, I can count the number of friends we have on the fingers of one hand. Now, he knew or he should have known that he was the reason why Iran was isolated, why countries were abandoning in Iran, because of that kind of behavior, that kind of, you know, approach to foreign policy and putting expediency and factional interest and winning the power struggle in Tehran above everything else. And that they did successfully. I mean, nobody can deny the fact that this hostage taking was a major political win for the Khomeinists. I mean, they say so. They call it the second revolution. And today, 42 years later, later, many of those people who are still believers in the Khomeini's case will argue that this second revolution, taking over the embassy, was more consequential than the first revolution, i.e. the toppling of the Shah's uh, government. So this was, above all, a call they made. You know, some people, including Rafsanjani, although he never came out and, and said so in, in so many words, but admitted that this was a mistake, that this derailed the national development of the country of Iran. It might have served the purposes of Khomeini versus a bunch of radical leftists at the time, but in the longer term, what they found out, and some of them, as I said, admitted to this, like Raf Sanjani, was that it derailed the national development. It made Iran into pariah state, a position Iran remains in to this day, four decades later. And unfortunately, for the Iranian people and for the United States, the, the man who rules over Iran to this day, Ayatollah Khamenei, he hasn't been willing to accept that. He hasn't been willing to say it was something we did at the time. And in retrospect, we shouldn't have done it. Many of those hostage takers who Michael would have seen from the window when he was looking down have come out and publicly said, we made a mistake. We made a grave mistake. We took the destiny of the country of Iran in our hands and, and we, we ruined it. But Khamenei still plays politics with this. For Khamenei is still about, you know, looking at the American question, including what happened in 1979, through the prism of how he maximizes power in his hands now as an 82-year-old man who's been in power since 1989. So unfortunately, and, and this be my final point, unfortunately, we still haven't had a good, hard look by Iranian participants who openly will come out, who are still in the regime, who will be willing to come out and say, in retrospect, or in hindsight, we could have done things differently. Because anybody whose objective would say the costs for Iran and where Iran was forced to go, the path he was put on, has been disastrous since that momentous day on the 4th of November 1979. Michael, taking a look at the the other side of things and the the kind of U.S. end of the relationship, what do you see as the the kind of broader implications of the the hostage crisis? And do you think it was inevitable that once that happened, that the relationship would would become so toxic and and stay that way for so long? Was it inevitable? No, because we have gone to war before, and when we signed treaties, we stopped being toxic. Look at the relationship we have with, you know, we had with Germany a few weeks after the war ended or with Japan or with Vietnam today, for example. But this one was different. This one, part of the toxicity, is it, is the poison of the revolution or the relationship is because of the intense media coverage this had. Imagine the age group of people, say, born in the year 1970, nine years old when this happened in the United States, or go back to 1960. So they would be 18, 19 years old in 1979, 1980. Every day for the next 444 days and longer, actually, because it continued, they would hear over and over, Iran is evil, Iran is awful, Iran is a monster, Iran is bad. This was drilled into an entire generation of people in the United States who were young then and who are now decision makers. I've done a lot of lecturing you know, to military groups at the Army War College, other places. And when I talk to today's decision makers about their age group, where they were when all of this happened, it made a tremendous personal impression on them and made Iran seem extremely negative and evil to them. 
I remember once, this would be back in the year 2010, I was giving a presentation to a very senior level group of American military officers. You know, they were colonel and general on up, lots of stars and lots of brass. And I was trying to be impartial and just give a you know, sort of black and white where we are, where Iran is. And one of the generals, very senior, stood up, you know, his face had turned dark red. And he just screamed, but they're killing our boys. You know, he totally lost control. And there was nothing I could say because this was sort of bred into them. If you want to look at toxicity or when the poison will cease, it will cease when the Iranian leadership, which has built a lot of its legitimacy around being anti-American, stops parading around on American flags, stops walking on them so that we don't have to look at it in the newspapers. And when the generation of generals and senior officials who are now, oh, 60 years old and over, well, 50 to 60 years old, 70 years old, when they are all dead, has that both sides, because you're not going to convince any American senior leader or any Iranian senior leader that they should sit back and start acting like adults. They have it in their DNA now. It's in their blood they hate us. We, not me, but too many of us hate them. It is toxic. It is crazy, but that's where it is. And you see this over and over when you see the comments that various senior or former senior American officials make about Iran here, and the comments that senior officials from Iran make about the United States. Everything we do, they think is evil. Everything they do, we think is evil. I regret that a great deal. I spent a lot of years in Iran. I was there for more than seven years, and I was the third generation in my family to go to Iran. I don't feel it, never did, I never understood it. Well, I can understand it, but there's nothing I can do to, you know, make it better. How's that? And all I can say is the senior leadership in both places who feel this way have to disappear like, you know, the leaves of autumn blow away somewhere so that a newer generation that doesn't feel this way can come up and uh, start making decisions. No, I think that's a really, a really important point to make that we've lost that whole generation of people like yourselves who had that, that experience of Iran, who, who traveled there, lived there, learned to speak the language and all of that. And that just hasn't been possible in the same way. And we've lost those, those sort of interlocutors that would, that would naturally be there otherwise. And I don't know how to solve that particular problem. Alex, shifting gears somewhat, one of the, uh, the broader points you make in your book that I wanted to touch on as well is that since the revolution, Iranian leaders have always put narrow factional interests ahead of the national interest, often at the expense of, of ordinary Iranians, something we've seen with sanctions probably most uh, evocatively. Can you kind of elaborate on that point? Why is that? What would that take to change? I'll start off, Alistair, by making the following point. I don't think Iran is necessarily the only country where that phenomena exists, where a group of people at the top decide oftentimes putting their own interest above the national interest. I don't think that Sili Iran is the only country that has to deal with that reality. What I do want to say, when I researched this book, and looking at the last 42 years of Iranian foreign policy making and all the sort of turns and twists that went into it, it was very clear to me that if I had to say which of the two, factional interests versus national interests, prevailed, it was very clear to me that the factional interests were the ones that the top leadership at the time always cared about more than anything else. And I mean, one can look at examples. We just talked about what happened in 1979. And nobody can credibly say that that served Iranian national interests in 1979 or since. It didn't serve Iranian national interest in 1979, right? We forget the Shah was admitted for medical treatment. Jimmy Carter was against it, but his advisors convinced him, and there you have it. But it wasn't just the Shah's being admitted to the United States that was the reason. As I pointed out, what to do with the left was another factor that mobilized Khomeini. They wanted to take that anti-Americanism away from the left and adopt it for their own purposes because it was an expedient thing to do. 
Nor should we forget that the United States did have a history Iran before 1979, and it wasn't always positive. And Michael can talk about this much more than me. But I mean, if you want to go back to 1953, there was the role of the United States in, in the removal of Mohammad Mossadegh. A lot of Iranians do hold that against the United States, did, and some to, to some extent do to this day. But my point still remains that taking over the embassy in 1979 was a bad decision on the day that fateful day and has proven to be been wrong ever since. You know, but that wasn't the only time they made decisions that were more about power in Tehran than about advancing Iranian national interest. For me, the Iran-Iraq war is another prime example of how Khomeini basically was, in my view, and some people might find this controversial, was more guilty than Saddam Hussein in generating the Iran-Iraq war. And, you know, I know Saddam Hussein was a party that invaded Iran in September of 1980. But I want to say to people, look at what Khomeini said in the months beforehand and, you know, how he incited this Arab dictator. Why did Khomeini do that? I mean, it was purely ideological. It wasn't because of national interest of Iran at the time. And I think if you look at the overall 42 years of Iranian foreign policy, I mean, take the take the position that Iran has on, say, the United States or its position on the country of Israel. Again, it seems to me to be the case that the man who runs Iran essentially single-handedly, although that to some extent is an exaggeration, but he's certainly the most powerful, Ayatollah Khamenei, he believes that if he changes policy stance on the United States, if he gets out of hand, if he controls or loses control over the process, that he would be weakening his own hand politically in Tehran. So he has never been able to be willing to take a risk on the U.S. question. He's never been able to sort of say, let's have a comprehensive policy review. In fact, people, if they can write in Persian, Google the word, you know, Iran-U.S. policy review, nothing comes up because that's not what Khamenei does. He doesn't want the United States back in Tehran, at least not for now, because he feels that the reopening of that American embassy will be the same as his position in Tehran being weakened. To me, the headline there is he puts his own interest his grip on power above the national interest, because there is nothing in Iranian national interest right now that is being served by U.S. and Iran being where they are in this lack of relationship where we know things could be very different if they were actually able to talk and to act like two states that can look for ways of cooperation instead of just constantly talking about the bad past. We're running short on time here, but before we wrap up, I want to give each of you uh, a chance to get in any final comments on how you see things developing moving forward and any kind of broader takeaways or or lessons from history that you want to kind of conclude with. Starting with you, Michael. You know, time has a way of curing everything eventually. In time, the top leaders who are involved in both sides who, you know, like to trade curses and throw things at one another will disappear, go the way of every other top leader in the past. My younger friends, university people I talk to, university students, have no animus towards Iran that I can see. In fact, I often get asked the question, why are we you know, so hostile? Or, you know, Why is the relationship so hostile? They don't know the background of it, or they don't feel the background of it. For them, it's just a matter of history. Sort of like the Korean War for my generation happened a long time ago. I was a young kid, didn't pay attention to it. That will change. I would like to think that we have mutual interests. We do, but we're never going to say it. It would be far better for much of the region if we would simply step back. It would be really nice if the Iranians would someday say, hey, I'm sorry. Never heard that. They say, we made a mistake, but I've yet to hear anyone say, I'm sorry. So, you know, I'm not waiting for it either, particularly, because I don't think it will ever come. But that sort of understanding, that sort of maturity will be necessary for a good relationship to get reestablished. Will I see it in my time? Well, I'm 75. Do I ever expect to be able to go back to Iran and visit old friends or, you know, old places that I really enjoyed being in? Probably not. I don't see that happening in my lifetime. Maybe 20 years from now, 15, 20 years from now, when all of this is buried and all the people who have an emotional stake or have let their emotions run over their intelligence in this, you know, will be gone. And the younger um, populations in both countries can just sort of say, let's get rid of that stuff and, you know, deal with each other. It'll happen eventually. 
Alex, how about you? Any final thoughts? No, I, I'm, I would just say I'm optimistic in terms of the future of U.S.-Iran relations. There is so much now at this point that you know, keeps the two countries together. One you know, very important fact to keep in mind is there's a million plus Iranian American community with ties to the old world uh, and to Iran. And, you know, that's not going to go away anytime soon. So there will be a good sized population in this country that always has an interest in terms of where Iran is going. Iranian pulses in the region will mean that the United States, American policymakers need to keep an eye on Iran, understand Iran, at least understand the policymaking process to be able to contribute to U.S. understanding of Iranian behavior and, and find ways to deal with it. I also want to remind everyone, and I'm sure Michael would agree with this, the Iranian population is not anti-American. It's the Iranian leadership, which is a minority of probably 10, 15% of a country of 85 million people, right, that have turned anti-Americanism into an instrument of political repression, basically. If you question the orthodoxies around the American policy in Tehran, you get into trouble, including every single president since 1989. Rafsanjani couldn't touch the American issue because Khamenei didn't allow it. Mohammad Khatami, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, Hassan Rouhani, and this fellow, Ibrahim Raisi, doesn't have it in him to do anything as such. But if he did want to question it, he wouldn't be allowed either. In that sense, I agree with Michael that the departure of Khamenei is a pivotal moment. And it's a moment the United States has to be ready for because we don't want to just educate Americans about the rest of the world, countries like Iran. We also want to try and sort of get to those Iranians that are very much open to learning more about America. They aren't anti-American per se. And there's a small group of people in Iran, the far right, as I like to call them, that this is their bread and butter. This is what they live off, anti-Americanism. Anything that goes wrong in the world, if there's an earthquake somewhere, the Americans did it. You want to counter that narrative. You want to be ready to counter it, particularly the, the day Khamenei dies, because that's how you can shape the future of that country. I simply think Iran is too important as a nation state for the United States to sort of just say things will be like this forever and ever. It wasn't before 1979, and hopefully soon we'll go back to something that, you know, an Iran that the Iranian people could choose their own destiny and didn't live under the political circumstances they're living under right now, we would have very different relations between Tehran and, and Washington. We'll have to leave things there for today. But Alex, Michael, thank you both for joining us on the program. You're very welcome. Thank you, Alistair. That was Alex Fatanka and Michael Matrinko. You can follow all of MEI's coverage of Iran on our website at www.mei.edu. Thank you to our listeners for tuning in and to our production team for their work on today's episode. You can follow MEI on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, and subscribe to our email newsletters for the latest analysis and information about upcoming events. I'm Alistair Taylor. We will see all of you next week. This has been a presentation of the Middle East Institute. To support MEI's programs and podcasts, please donate at www.mei.edu. Thank you for your support.